And I felt really early on that I had to make a uh, choice of what color I was because everyone else was confused. I uh, had a crush on in preschool and I kissed him in class. I called him my boyfriend. I mean, I had girlfriends because I figured if I did that, then it would kind of take the eyes off of me and the mm -hmm. questions. I started sleeping with a Bible under my pillow because I thought that God could help me. Wow. Hi, this is Lauren Engel of Sidewalk Talk today. I'm here with Parson James. Hello. <laughs> so you were born in South Carolina? Yes, a small little little town down there, uh, about 5,000 people. Yeah. It's called Chiraw, and it like, you have to have a southern accent to really even understand what that sounds like. Chiraw. <laughs> Chiraw, yeah. <laughs> and both your parents are like from there, from there? Like both their families have been there for a while, right? Yeah, um, my mom's... My mom's mom is from like Illinois or something, but oh. she moved down there when she was like 17. And then my mom's dad was always from there. And then my dad's side was always from there. Yeah, and even, wait, so your dad's side was a really famous musician, right? Yeah, my dad's dad is a um, really famous gospel singer. Um, I really, I never had a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. He was like this like, like <laughs> myth that, or like, what is that mystical creature that I like, I like always heard about and saw videos and stuff of, but he, he didn't have a relationship with my dad, so then I just didn't have her, I didn't know him. Yeah. And then your, but your uncle and your aunt are like God's children of Whitney Houston or something? God. Oh yeah, so the, um, <laughs> my grandpa's children, I guess, are my uncle and aunt. <laughs> uh, they were like in the movie The Preacher's Wife with Whitney Houston. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they, they were her godchildren, I guess. She probably had a lot of godchildren, I guess, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a really musical upbringing where you went to gospel all the time. Yeah, and as, um, you know, the, the town that I grew up in was very just church-oriented, and the town that I was born in, um, a really famous jazz musician called J uh, Dizzy Gillespie mm -hmm. It's from there, so the town kind of like, you know, had little remnants of things to be proud of, and that was one of them, and so, you know, there was definitely like a lot of music in my life growing up. Yeah, and so you had have mixed parents, but how did how long did you realize like until like your whole situation of everything? Like, uh, did you realize like since you were young or? Yeah, because I feel like you know kids are just kind of rude and difficult anyway, obviously. And I felt really early on that I had to make a uh, choice of what color I was because everyone else was confused. Mm. I wasn't necessarily confused at first. I was just like, oh, okay, yeah, that's just my life. But then, like, as I got, like, a little older and into school and stuff, and I realized, like, oh, people want you to be one thing or the other, mm. that's when it started getting a little weird. Yeah. And then you didn't really have much contact with your dad, right? He had, like, drug addictions from early on. Yeah. So, I mean, he was a great, a great person whenever my mom and him met. Um, really talented, you know, very popular, likable guy. Like basketball, right? Yeah. He was, yeah. He played basketball. He was really sought after. And I don't know, you know, I think that with um, addiction and drugs and that sort of thing, it's, it's, it's obviously mental. And, it, you know, I have spent a lot of time thinking about it and healing on it and, like, just realizing that some people, you know, his, up, his upbringing was really terrible and his mom had him when she was 13 or 14. Yeah. Um, you know, some people are the product of how they're, brought up and some people um, look at how they're brought up and try to change and unfortunately maybe he just didn't have the mental capacity to change so he, he got addicted to drugs and he left when I was like four. Mm -hmm. And he still, does he still contact you time to time for like money? He did, he did. Um, about a few years back. I haven't spoken to anybody on that side of the family for like four years. Oh wow. Yeah. And then you've always been like close to your mom, right? Yeah. 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 So like I mean, she pretty much raised me solo, um, since because she, she was kicked out when she was 16. Yeah. So, um, you know, at 16, I think that she had this desire to prove her family wrong. You know, I think that her whole fight was just because this man's black doesn't mean that he's a bad person, because, you know, that's the mentality of the town. If you're mm. black, you're just, like, not supposed to be with a white person. And so she fought for who she loved, and then she's also fighting for this kid in her stomach. And uh, so she, she really was like an incredible, like, an incredible woman for, you know, balancing all these jobs and, you know, going against her parents and um, just, you know, fighting for what she believed in. Unfortunately, my dad became a stereotype, but obviously, again, that's because of mental issues. It's not because of his color. Um, 
but yeah, I've always been close to her, mm -hmm. so we, we, it was always just me and her, Wait, and yeah. my great-grandmother, too. Um, oh. She passed away, but she was a big help with my mom. Oh, wow. Was it difficult, kind of, because her father was really against your dad, right? Like, burning crosses and stuff? Yeah. So th how did you, like, wrap your head around that at such a young age? So, I mean, I think all of that crazy, crazy stuff was happening whenever I was very young, so, like, mm. maybe before memories and stuff, but... Um, my mom was a daddy's girl, like my mom and him were really close. And I think that more than anything, she was so hurt by like the fact that the person that she loved the most and she thought loved her the most could get to that point of hatred, you know? Mm. But, you know, again, my mom's taught me uh, to always kind of think of a person's story. And if, you know, her dad was actually in a, a 400 person town, um, a community of all white people that were completely racist his entire life. and. His mom, you know, she was, you know, an, an addict, and she, she, she was, you know, known, she had a promiscuous kind of, like, reputation, and um, his dad was an addict. I mean, his dad killed his mom in front of him, and then his oh, mom, wow. um, and then his dad killed himself, you know, so, like, my mom's always, like, think about these people's story. Mm. Like, her dad really had no chance on thinking outside the box because of the small space that he was confined in, so, um, by the time I was, like, five, he was really trying really hard to patch up oh, wow. that hatred that he kind of spewed. And so I knew him growing up and I think he really, he tried very hard whenever I was a kid to kind of make up for what he did to my mom, but she never oh. really, she never really got over that. It wasn't until he was on his death that he died of alcoholism, mm -hmm. um, that there was some peace and closure. She went in and she told him that she forgave him and pretty much like he died like within hours after that. Wow. So it was like something he was holding on to and he was trying to change for sure, but yeah, it's just circumstantial. It's really mm -hmm. terrible, yeah. And then did you always know since you were young that you were gay? Since I, since I was like at least in preschool. Like I remember like there, I had a friend that I uh, had a crush on in preschool and I kissed him in class called him my boyfriend to him and stuff like I was smart enough to not say that out loud because mm. I knew what the community was like but um and then I can remember like this girl kissing me on the playground and I completely was offended I was like she disrespected me she kissed me without asking <laughs> oh my god <laughs> so I remember like <laughs> I remember like a clear difference of how I felt kissing my male friend than when a girl kissed me without asking yeah yeah and then, but you also were raised with like a, a lot of your mom and they thought you were just like really feminine, right? Yeah. Everyone, there was really only women around. I didn't ever yeah. have a dad. My mom never had men in the house or obviously anyone. She, she never wanted what happened with my dad to happen again. So she was pretty like dead set on not having another man in the house. Oh. Um, so, you know, there was that. And then my mom's mom, my aunt, then my dad's grandma and my great-grandmother. It was like all women, mm -hmm. yeah. And were there other people in the town who were gay or like did you have any peers to like go through what you were going through? No, uh -oh. um, there's not, I didn't know one. I knew one gay person at all and it was my cousin, Michelle. And she's older than me, she's, she passed away but she would be like, I think she'd be like 46 or seven now. So oh. as a kid she was like an older cousin but I have a memory of her writing a letter to my family, apologizing, this is my dad's side of the family, mm. apologizing for who she was and saying like she wished that she could change it, but she can and she loves them, she hopes they love her. And the memory is like they reading, they're reading it out loud and they like rip it up and like laugh about it. And so I was like, okay. Wow. But from a young age, she like definitely, if she would come home for Thanksgiving or if she was ever around, she would definitely gravitate towards me, and I think she had an understanding, and she definitely knew um, as a kid that, you know, that I was gay. I think she picked up on that, and she definitely held me close, and so I had that one example. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. How else would you describe your personality back then growing up? Mine? Yeah. Like, really funny, charismatic. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, always trying to make people laugh to deflect, probably from things that I was hiding. Oh, so your peers were accepted of you? Um, I was never out. Oh, I think that true. I became like a class clown situation 
so people would focus on like me being funny rather than me being um, you know me being gay I didn't want anyone to ask because I was terrified so I mean I had girlfriends because I figured if I did that then it would kind of take the eyes off of me and the questions mm -hmm. was it difficult for you like faking like having a double like not really double life but faking it yeah like... but at the same time like I did go through a period of probably being brainwashed because the church was so present and you know all the people and all the most popular kids and all the you know all the people in the community were in church and stuff and I was just like wanted to be like them mm -hmm. or fit in so like I thought I was convinced for a bit it was a phase you know, and I started sleeping with a Bible under my pillow because I thought that God could help me. Wow. And all these things, like, so yeah, it was difficult for a bit, but I was always so inquisitive as a kid, and I was always told that you can't ask questions about God, so, like, it just never was going to work for me. I was like, I need to know why <laughs> this is wrong and this is right. I need to know why, um, you know, we can't welcome this person in because they are different. I need to know why you know, this religion is spouting that it's about love when we're hating on an interracial couple. And nobody could give me the answer to those questions and also told me not to ask questions, so it was just frustrating mm. more than anything. And then, but so you, when you moved to New York, you moved with your girlfriend, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. She's so great. Um, she is... I think that I met her, I always try to find purpose in why people come in or out of your life. And I like, even with exes and, you know, friendships that maybe go wrong, I try to think of like what I learned from that or like what I taught that person. And I think that me and her were from a very small, small place where we had really big dreams because she was a dancer. Mm. And I met her and I told her like, I want to go to New York. I want to move to New York. She's like, I want to go dance in New York. I want to go to Juilliard. I want to go to Alvin Ailey or, you know, something. And so we pretty much, like, connected and bonded over, like, we're getting out. And we did. She got into a big dance school, and then I got into New York and started doing the music thing. And obviously she landed a big gig, and then she had to move. And that's when we broke up because it was, like, we're 17. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm in New York. And I was like, maybe you're going to find the love of your life. And... Really, I was like, I want to go twirl at the gay club. <laughs> so, and she knew all that? Or no, she that didn't. Time? She didn't. And I, at the time we were like growing up, I was always like, oh, we can't have sex because of God. <laughs> oh, yeah. She um, probably was like, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she definitely got a little over it after a while. You know, hormones are fucking crazy in high school. And then, um, yeah, so then I came, she, she was a dancer, so uh, she introduced me to all of her friends who were also dancers, which were like a lot of gay guys and a mm -hmm. lot of like girls that took me out and I came out to them first, that group. And um, she found out later and she's so sweet. She's like such a, like, she reminds me of like Britney Spears early days. Like she's just like a sweet Southern girl. She told me that I wish, she said, oh, I wish that you would have told me so I could have been a friend to help you through it instead of a girl to help you oh, hide it. Wow. Yeah. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we're still friends now. She does yeah. really well. She is married and yeah, I keep up with her. <laughs> and didn't you have like a Britney Spears poster in, in, high, in school? In Christian school. Yeah. In fourth grade. <laughs> and I got like so much trouble because they were like, Britney Spears is a false idol. And I was like, she's a real idol. <laughs> she's a real idol. Oh my God. <laughs> and I refused to take it out. <laughs> What did your mom think of you moving to New York? She was like, she's never told me that anything was impossible. She's always let me make my own decisions and do what I want. She was, as an only child and as a single parent, she had lived her life so much for me that mm. I think that whenever I was like, Mama, I'm moving here, she was like, Ugh, what am I going to do now? Because <laughs> like, you know, now my job is over and... I've been living for you, just like kind of working to support you and make sure that you have a great childhood. So it was good. It was good. At first it was bad. She, you know, got really bad anxiety and she was really, really upset about it. But luckily she met my stepdad like right when I moved. And um, so she had someone. And then she realized her passion. 
she realized her dreams. Um, she wanted to become an esthetician, oh. and she had never had the time to do it. So basically, she like took time off. She uh, gave my grandparents, sorry, my her mom, um, our old house that we grew up in, and she moved in with my stepdad, and then she started going to aesthetic school, and now she owns a spa. Wow, yeah, so that's awesome. <laughs> it was good. And then when you were in New York, you were just really good at networking, right? That's yeah. why you got your name out there. Yeah. <laughs> Very social. <laughs> Love to have a drink at <laughs> and just be social. And I was doing that for a while. You know, I, got, I was just like doing shows. Then I was underage, and so certain venues didn't want me in there. Mm -hmm. But I convinced them, and they'd like put X's on my hand and walk me through oh, and let true. me sing. I'd be singing to like 12 people. I didn't care. Yeah. Then I'd meet someone every time I was out. And I utilized contacts really well, kept keep in touch with people really well. And um, yeah, just kind of just putting my nose out there mm -hmm. and uh, getting in the scene. I had like a residency at this burlesque bar whenever I was like 19. So I sang every Wednesday, yeah. soul music. And um, it was like $25. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but no, there I met like so many crazy people like Bill Cosby's daughter, who's oh, like, wow. oh my God, I'm obsessed with your stuff. And like, you know, she she like helped me and introduced me to so many people. And then you meet my friend Brian, who plays trumpet for Gaga. And then like introduced me to Gaga. It was like, you're meeting all these crazy people. New York is just magical in that way where every corner is someone doing something really awesome, but it's not in a showy way. Yeah. Like here in LA, I feel like status and like, I don't know, status and reputation, where, what you can do for someone is really important. And New York is just sort of like, you don't know who the hell you're sitting beside, you know? Mm -hmm. They're not like shouting it from the rooftop. But um, yeah, it's cool, it's inspiring. And that's how, well you met Lady Gaga's like vocal coach through MySpace, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I was all about that shit. Like Googling, Googling like who does this for who, like cold emailing, Yeah. sending videos. Yeah, and then I... I'm, I hit him up and then we started working together. Yeah, and he was like really impressed and didn't even charge you like back then. He would like not, if I couldn't, like yeah. he would totally not. Like, yeah, he was, he was great for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And then your mom kind of like visited and saw your like living condition, right? Like next to the staircase of your bed. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, I quit college. And I was like, I can't go to school anymore. Oh, where, you were going to college in New York? Yeah, just real briefly to the new school for jazz. Oh. And then I but quit. You, so, did you were you thinking of graduating, or you? Oh were just, no, I used. Oh, why did you go then? Because my mom forced me to go to oh. college because she just thought I was just rond wandering around <laughs> New York. <laughs> so, I mean, what ended up being a waste of time and money because I knew I wasn't going to go to class. Um, yeah, I quit school. I was working at restaurants, and um, I moved to Bushwick. It was like a house of like five lesbians and like five dogs. <laughs> and they built this little room, not even, they built it like a little bed under a staircase, like Harry Potter. <laughs> and Harry Potter. <laughs> it was in the middle of the walkway from the bathroom to another bedroom, so constantly just getting walked through all oh. night. <laughs> and it's when we were young, so everyone was drunk and partying all the time. And then you started getting into like doing demos or writing for other people, right? Yeah. So actually through the, the vocal coach guy, Gordon, um, I met a producer that he was working with, or the producer was coming to him and looking for vocalists. And I went in there one day and he was there at the same time, just by chance. And he made me sing for him and I did. And then, so then I started working with this guy. Cause basically you come from a small town where you're kind of like the only singer. You think, oh shit, I'm such a good singer. The best singer. <laughs> you think that, and then you get to an open mic in New York and you hear like 10 Whitney Houston like <laughs> level vocals. And you're like, how the fuck am I gonna stand out? And it was clear that like, I always love writing um, stories and poems and you know, that sort of thing. Um, it was clear that like writing had to become an aspect. So I met this producer guy, he lived like, two and a half hours on train away mm. from the city, but I would go like three to four times a week. Wow, that's coming. And, you know, oftentimes, another fucking staircase situation, 
he like randomly lived, okay, I guess like it was his family's house, and in the basement he had his like lair, <laughs> where like his studio and like his room was and stuff, but the top part of the house was like for sale, so like everyone was constantly going in and viewing the house, and we were like underneath, and he set up like a mattress at the bottom of the stairs that like connected on the top stair and like just kind of laid. Mm -hmm. So I slept there if I had to like <laughs> sleep over and stuff. <laughs> but um, so I started working with him and it was the first time that like, you know, he was really great in terms of um, asking me like, why are you writing a love song if you've never been in love? Or like, mm -hmm. why are you like, what's interesting about your life? And I really sat on his couch one day and like for four hours just started talking about growing up wow. he's like you know that's like your thing <laughs> you gotta tell your story in some way I was like okay <laughs> so then I like you know I started realizing my influences like Johnny Cash's and Elvis Presley's and Otis Redding's and um all sorts of things like that and then like we created this like EP and it was like the first time I dabbled with like the religious references and mm. I was like so long I had like just had such a scarred memory from that stuff and I'm like oh I can use this I can have power in this where I can like flip it and like tell stories with those inspira inspirations like from my point of view and stuff so I made this EP with him went up online um, and long story short this guy heard it messaged me on Twitter and was like I'm working on like the CeeLo Green project right now can't help you be an artist but if you want to write for this project mm -hmm. I was like sick so, I mean, I started gradually pulling away from that producer. He got, like, really possessive and never gave me demos. Like, got really crazy. Mm. It was really bad. Um, and I signed this fucking contract with him. That I told my mom about it, and she, like, wanted to see it, and I never showed it to her. I had crumpled up in my book bag, and I, like, signed it, and I gave it to him. And basically, he, like, owned me through the universe. <laughs> what? It's a typical story, but yeah. long story, I got out of it because he used the same lawyer as... He let me use, so it was like a conflict of interest. Oh. Anyway, um, yeah, the EP went up, Dave hit me up, and I started writing for other people. He was like, you know what, I think you got potential to be an artist, but he's like, right now, everyone's looking at like established acts they want to only work with those people. Mm. So he was like, but if you get in the room with these writers and you impress them and stuff, they'll want to work with you again. Or these yeah. people. So it was pretty, pretty quick, like two, three months oh, wow. of working, and then like, um, labels kept being like, oh, that voice is cool, who is that, and all of that stuff, and the songs that I was writing for CeeLo and stuff end up getting, like, pitched to this girl in the UK named Pixie Lot. Oh, huge. Yeah. Yeah. And she took, she took one of the songs as her first single from her album. Whoa. And then that, like, pretty much popped everything off. Yeah. Really, really random. But then, like, the session started becoming for me, because I've never been, like, I'm not against writing for other people. I think it's really great. And it frees up some creative space because like oftentimes when you're writing for your project, you can get like so stuck on like, I can't say that word, I can't do that. That doesn't fit with the album or whatever, you know? Um, writing for other people, you just have kind of freedom to like tell another person's story. Mm. But um, yeah, then the session started coming towards for me and a lot of people were interested. The EP was kind of like gaining minor virality. Like it was getting really cool. And then, um, I met the, this, these two other guys, Dave, who had messaged me on Twitter. He was like, you need a manager. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and, and so he's like, part, he's like, I want to partner with my friend, Tim. So these two guys from uh, New Zealand had a management company, and they came out to a show of mine. And it was a show that, like, I don't know why so many music managers were there to like see me and try to manage me and oh, I don't wow. remember when th this was and I think I kind of like blocked out whatever period of time that was and like mm. but I was constantly like emailing people and like listen to this come to this you know like googling and how figuring out people's email addresses and all that sort of stuff um but these two New Zealand guys came we had like a lot of beers my mom was there and they were so chill and I was like yeah let's work together so then I started working with them, building my first, what was gonna look like an album, you know? And uh, they had another artist, Lord, oh, yeah. and it was before she blew up. It was like right before Royals dropped. And then um, when Royals dropped, 
like everything like fucking turned upside down and um i started going over to the uk and europe while they were dealing with the massive <laughs> thing that was happening with their artist and uh i wrote a lot of great songs um started shaping up my first like major label ep i wrote i wrote this song stole the show with my friend kyle and it was like a piano ballad and it was like the craziest session i think i had I know I was hungover, but I thought I had like the flu. It was like bad. Mm. And I wanted to get out of the session so quick, so we wrote that song in like 45 minutes. And what? I like sent it over to my managers. And like at the time, Dave, who found me on Twitter, he basically was the introduction to the, to the New Zealand company. So he was like working on the side with me, but the actual managers were these other two guys. And the main guy I could never get through to, I felt like he doesn't he doesn't even care about like my stuff. Like he's, you know, they're so focused on their other artists that like I feel like my music's not good enough to even cut through. But I sent that song over and then like everybody in the company started sending me messages like, oh man, like this is so special, blah blah blah. And I was like, really? Because like I mean I had the over. flu and I was hungover. And it's like I was so like I don't know, it was like surprising. So anyway. I meet this guy Elof and I start writing with him. And we wrote a song called Temple. And uh, that started shaping that first EP, the Temple EP that I put out. Mm. Went from Temple and then like Center Like You, which was originally a poem that I like wrote for my mom about coming out. And um, then all the other songs just started to fall into place and everything felt really cohesive. I like changed my name to Parson and I like, my real name's Ashton Parson, mm. but I was always like real interested in having Parson as a first name. Oh. And so when, this, when Temple came, I was like, oh, this makes so much sense, you know. Parson is like a word for like a version of a preacher. I'm telling sermons that I believe in. I had this, you know, I had it all figured out. I was like, oh, yeah. getting a hat, <laughs> like, <laughs> like all of it. Like I had just, I was so visual at that point. I was like, I know exactly right now in this moment what I want to be. What was the inspirations for like adding James and uh, like your style? Um, James comes from James Dean mm. and I find that like my life and you asked me earlier about like how I felt being mixed it was so conflicted because it was like you know one side of my family is white one side of my family is black I'm gay but I can't say anything like just so much turmoil and just kind of questioning who I was in terms of like you know, the morality, if I'm, like, right or wrong for being, for knowing that I'm gay, like, all that inner turmoil was fucking crazy, so I found that the James, because I know James Dean was a person that struggled with bisexuality, he often played, like, rebel roles, but, you know, had this, like, soft spot, there's, like, a lot of back and forth and confliction with, like, himself, and I just admired him as a figure in, like, Hollywood for a long time. Mm. And I put Parson and James together, it kind of, for me, made up this, like, yeah, conflicted, like, biblical sort of thing. Mm. Um, and I just felt like I was assuming the power, after all the years of being preached at and told what I was, that I had the opportunity to use music as a way to, like, tell my story and say exactly what was actually right. Um, so that's when that started happening. Yeah. The record started falling into place. Was um, that like after you signed, uh, before I signed with RCA? Yeah, this is before. Okay. Um, How long ago was RCA? 2015. Okay, yeah. So like the record, the EP and stuff was finished by like the end of 2013. Or at least like the first part of 2014. And then we got hit up by this DJ. And... Was it Kygo? Yeah. Okay. And so now like Stole the Show has been written since like 2012 or something. And... Now, we get hit up about this song that I was just like, I'm gonna put on my album or whatever. I was gonna just put it on my EP. Mm. And um, yeah, I guess his management, because I guess he had just signed to RCA. And oh. they were looking to break him away from this, he was just doing remixes. <laughs> Tropical House. Yeah, yeah, they were looking to break him away from like just doing remixes, because all he had on SoundCloud was like a Marvin Gaye remix and maybe two other at the time. Mm. And they're like, we, want, we see him as like a, you know, Calvin Harris-ish sort of thing. Yeah. And so they were listening to the records, I guess, and then came across mine, and we just kind of got hit up from all angles. From the label side, RCA was already interested, but then they really wanted this to happen because it would be two of their artists, potentially, 
because they wanted to sign me. Yeah. Um, but my initial gut thing was like, no. Because they just said dance remix, and I was like, ugh. No, this is a beautiful ballad. I'm just not touching it. And then everyone kept pushing me and pushing me, and then I started talking to Kaigo on Facebook. Yeah. And then I was like, there's no harm in letting him give it a try. It's like my song, I have the ultimate say in the end. Yeah. So I'm going to say like at, le- like at least 20 versions of the song back and forth. And came out and I was like, that's not really the dance music I was expecting. Like, it's really different. Mm, it's just more melodic. Yeah, it's yeah. like, there's like musicality to it. So I said yes. And yeah, and then I'm gonna say a few months later that song came out. And then that was really weird. Yeah. I was thinking like, blogs will pick this up, blogs will love this, it'll be tastemaker y, mm-hmm. and that'll be it. That'll, like, it's life will just be. <laughs> and you performed in there. it everywhere. And then, like, within like a month, it's like, oh, uh, yeah, let's play Coachella. I'm like, what? Like, on to Ellen and all this crazy yeah. shit. I'm like, okay. And then it's just surprising how the genesis of something is, like, where it begins and where it goes. And then after that Kaigo song, I put out my EP and then started the full blown solo run and still doing that. Yeah. You also toured with Kaigo, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot because just the way radio works in the industry and stuff is still something I don't understand, but it was an international radio thing um, overseas and stuff all of 2015, but it was like a full year to the day of release that um, the record label decided to take it to U.S. radio. So then I had to spend the rest of 2016 Mm. promoting it as well. So it was like a two-year situation, full-blown tour, you know? (laughs) touring and like just constantly performing that song whilst still trying to like make that little separation or like connect that yes that's me but look what I do on the side it's very different mm. um, what kind of inspirations do you have for your debut album coming up um, it's really 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 about the song and the emotion and the vocal and lyric I'm really inspired by like urban soul really inspired by um, celebration of self. I'm really inspired by situations that seem bleak, but there's always light at the end of the tunnel. There's always a way to come out on the other side. So lyrically and conceptually there, sonically, a lot of outcast influence, which sounds Mm. crazy. Um, A lot of Amy Winehouse and uh, a lot of Leaky Lee. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice blend. I'm having this moment of, you know, for a period of time when that EP came out, I thought that that was the box that I had to be trapped in, that I had to continue just being that gospel-tinged boy that <laughs> sings about the sadness of growing up somewhere that, you know, wasn't accepting. But so much has happened <laughs> in my life, you know, since and, and now and coming up that there's so much to talk about. Yeah. There's like love that went wrong. There's, you know, feelings of self-worth. There's like major changes to my team. Like I left that team that like I started with. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just a lot of new shit. I moved to LA, <laughs> um, which was lonely and terrifying at first. And trying to fall in love again, but also terrified of that shit. So there's a lot more on the spectrum to be speaking about rather than how I grew up. I think that the first EP was therapeutic and now I can talk about those situations in a way of maybe inspiring others rather than being so reflective. But how would have you say you've grown as a person since you were younger? Um, still have a lot of shit to to work out. Mm. You know, body image and self-confidence is something that easier said than done. Um, I think in terms of loving the person that I am, um, celebrating, celebrating my ability to love and learning my qualities that make me who I am and make me, you know, that make me proud, really. Like, I'm really acknowledging those more. Um... And not being so hard on myself. Mm. That's something 
I'm learning. <laughs> I'm making strides and I'd say like doing way better at. Um, yeah, I mean, we're all figuring shit out every day. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that also I'm like a lot more open and a lot more, you know, for a bit I was guarded and mm. closed off of certain ideas and stuff, but I think staying present is something I've learned and appreciating the moments, you know, for a bit of time, the success parts and stuff that came. I was always looking for what was next because I was just viewing everything as like fleeting and putting a timestamp on stuff instead of like savoring people and savoring uh, moments and situations and stuff. So I think I'm getting a, a lot better at that. Mm. What does love mean to you? <sighs> um, being totally and completely focused on the well-being and happiness of that person that you love, mm. whatever that means to them. It may not mean the same for you, but just always kind of looking out for that person's well-being. And, you know, I think that having to cut certain people out of my life that are family, um, even that comes from a place of love because I think that, you know, they, they didn't necessarily understand who I am or didn't want my best interest or well-being, but I have enough love for them as family members to know that I should step back rather than get to a point of further resenting them um, because I understand how they were brought up and how they think because of their conditions and environment. So I love them enough to step away. Um, so I think it's doing what's best for a person um, and being and coming in uh, with an open heart and like understanding I think. Mm -hmm. Last question, what do you want to be remembered for? Um, I feel like I feel like, I, and I've, I don't know, I've just been starting to realize this, that relationships that I have and people that I meet, I want to just always leave someone or whoever I'm with with like one good thing, whether that be, you know, aiding them in like learning to love themselves or pointing out something beautiful in them that they can't see. Um, I think that growing up I didn't know how beautiful of a person I was and I say that meaning that like I really hated myself for just being myself so mm. um, I want to be remembered for pointing out the beauty in people that they can't see and uh, celebrating myself and celebrating other people's uniqueness and um, honestly celebrating love for what love is and I don't know. I think that that self-love is so important. I want in some way to be remembered for driving that message through. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, a lot of people, mental health and like, you know, the way that you look at yourself, like, it's not like often talked about in the best light. And I think that conversation needs to be bigger and I hope to make that conversation bigger. Yeah, I love it. This is yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>